Hello and welcome back to another episode of Angiopod, the podcast for vascular fanatics. Back by popular demand, we have our second episode in the series of mock oral board review. Our special guest today will be introduced by Dr. Kuldeep Singh in the program. But the topic for today's discussion is venous disease. I hope you guys enjoy it. Again, if you would like to be an examinee in one of these mock oral board review sessions, do reach out to me on my Twitter. My handle is Angiopod. Let's get started. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. This is our second mock oral examination. We have a special guest today, Dr. Anil Hingarani, who is an associate professor at NYU Langone in Brooklyn. He's also the past president of the Eastern Vascular Society. Uh, he will be interviewing our fellow Dr. Vijay Tanjavar. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Hingarani, for joining us. And whenever you're ready, go ahead and uh, begin. Vijay, are you ready for this? Yes, I'm ready. All right. So whenever you guys are ready, go ahead and start. Okay, Vijay, you have a 53-year-old uh, white female who comes into the office complaining of painful varicose veins in the left leg for 13 years. All right. So I'll start with uh, asking a little bit about uh, on the history. When initially did she notice that uh, her veins were enlarged and what are the symptoms that she's having right now? She's been having pain and swelling and they've slowly been getting worse over the years. Okay. And uh, you said she's having it on the left leg, right? Mostly on the left leg. Mostly on the left leg. Okay. And uh, nothing on the right. That's what uh, the patient's uh, complaints are? The right leg is really much less. Okay. All right. And does the swelling decrease when she uh, sleeps in the night and wakes up in the morning or does she have the pain throughout the day and night? It gets worse in the evening time and it gets worse with standing at work and it's better in the morning after she's kept her legs up. Okay. Just for the sake of completion, ask her if she has any symptoms of claudication uh, such as when there's a pain increase on walking or does she make any effort? No, no. It doesn't get worse with walking. She's able to walk really well. Okay. And has she uh, seek any kind of treatment for this varicose veins in the past? No. No. Okay. Any other uh, medical comorbidities? No, she's otherwise very healthy. All right. And uh, what kind of work does she do? She works as a third grade teacher. So she's standing quite a bit. Okay. Does she have any abdominal symptoms such as swelling, abdominal pain or anything? No. All right. So at this point, I'll uh, do a physical examination of her bilateral lower extremities and the abdominal examination. So she has bilateral dorsalis, pedis, and posterior tibial pulses. She does have some varicosities involving the greater saphenous vein distribution on the left medial calf and some left mild ankle swelling. The right has minimal ankle swelling and just telling Tasia. Okay. After my physical examination, I'll uh, get the patient, send the patient for an ultrasound uh, venous duplex study. Okay. Which leg do you want to look at? I would want to look at bilateral uh, lower extremities. Your venous technician says that the greater saphenous vein has insufficiency on the left leg of 500 milliseconds in the calf and 3,000 milliseconds in the thigh. The right calf is only 100 milliseconds of reflux in the right calf and is only 300 milliseconds in the right thigh. All right, so that meets the criteria for a deep and uh, superficial venous insufficiency, which is superficial vein is up just at the point of 500 milliseconds and the deep, which is 3,000, which is much greater than 1,000 milliseconds. So that meets the criteria for a deep venous insufficiency. So at this point of time, uh, talk to the patient regarding uh, the options of management. And I would uh, recommend that the patient being symptomatic and uh, having significant varicose veins, tell her that it's uh, insufficiency in the deep venous system. So she will need uh, operative intervention for uh, uh, saphenovenous uh, ligation with stripping. Okay, the tech actually didn't look at the deep system. She only looked at the greater saphenous vein. Okay. But she, do you want her to look at the deep system? Yes. Then I would ask my, uh, send the patient back to my technician to look for deep venous system and the perforators uh, system. Okay, so she looks at the deep system. She notes no DVT. She says that the perforators look like they're small small and competent, and the deep venous insufficiency is also greater than 1,000 milliseconds in both sides in the femoral popliteal segment. Okay. At this point, one of my differentials, uh, this being the left side, is that the patient uh, could have some kind of a May-Turner kind of syndrome, or a com compressive syndrome. I would talk to the patient regarding the endovascular options of uh, endovenous uh, option of looking into uh, with an IVUS and then uh, doing a diag diagnostic and therapeutic intervention. She's had these symptoms for so long that she's interested in having some relief from these symptoms, so she's willing to proceed. Okay, the patient having a relatively younger, not significant comorbidities, then I would 
get uh, send the patient for a CT venogram just to make sure that the central venous system is uh, patent and that she has no compressive uh, mass or anything uh, uterine pathology or ovarian pathology uh, com- having any compression effects on the central venous system. Her insurance company denies the approval for her CT venogram as she's not tried prior conservative therapy. And then I would book the patient for uh, intraoperative uh, IVA study along with the uh, intraoperative venogram and endo- a venogram. They do deny the approval because of the same reason. Then I would suggest non-operative management with uh, compressive stockings and uh, NSAIDs and uh, limb elevation overnight to see whether there is any improvement in the limb swelling and uh, her symptoms. What type of stockings do you want to prescribe? Uh, above knee uh, thigh-high compressive stockings, uh, 30 to 40 millimeter. She says they're awfully tight and hard to put on. I would suggest that uh, the best compressive uh, results are with 30 to 40 millimeter, but if the patient is very uncomfortable with them, probably I'll reduce it to the 20 to 30 millimeter compression. She's willing to try it. When do you want to see her again? I would like to uh, give a trial of one month and bring her back in a month's time to see if there's any improvement in her symptoms. She says that she's been using the stockings every day. She comes back a month later and the symptoms really are not better. She's still having persistent symptoms. So at this point of time, I would uh, reconsider uh, intraoperative intervention and I'll talk to the insurance company saying that the patient did not I tried conservative management with compressive therapy and uh, NSH. The patient has no relief. So at this point, it warrants uh, operative intervention. So what type of operative intervention do you want to offer her? She's asking. So I'll uh, again initially do a, a CT venogram to make sure that there is no intra-abdominal, intra-pelvic pathology and then book her for a uh, lower extremity, left lower extremity venogram and uh, I was study. The CT venogram fails to show any pathology in the pelvis and no compressive of the left iliac vein or the right iliac veins. Okay. So I'll bring her to the operating room. I have the patient under a mild sedation in a prone position access the popliteal vein and uh, do a venogram. Uh, before you get there, the insurance company asks you for a copy of the CT venogram and you get a call from the medical director saying that the CT venogram doesn't show any lesion, so they're not going to approve the iliac vein study with the IVIS or the venogram. So, but I, I would talk to them and reason out that the patient still has you know, the pathology or the signs and symptoms of varicosities and still having the, the reflux at the saphenofemoral junction, but we don't know that the CT scan was uh, to make sure that there's no mass effect, but CT is not the best study to look at a dynamic compression such as a Maytherno syndrome. The medical director is suguesting that they'd be willing to have a infrainguinal venous procedure done since the reflux seems pretty prominent in the left greater saphenous vein. Okay, then at this point of time, I will do a saphenofemoral uh, ligation with stab phlebectomy and stripping of the great saphenous vein. The patient's not interested in general anesthesia. She wants to try a minimally invasive procedure. Okay, I would also offer an option of uh, an EVLT or a radio frequency ablation. She says that she's read about these before. Are there any differences between these two? Would you suggest one over the other? The results between the two are almost equivocal, so there is. I don't have any preference of one over the other. She's willing to proceed with an endovenous procedure of the greater saphenous vein. How would you proceed? Okay, so I would access the... the... Before you do that, she asks you about the risks and the benefits. So the risks are that the patient might have it develop a new DB secondary to the intervention as a iatrogenic uh, complication and there could be uh, skin burns and uh, skin ulcerations as the radio frequency can have some heat uh, sink effects but the advantage is it's a minimally invasive procedure and it's an office based procedure and the patient doesn't need to be given any kind of uh, significant anesthesia and can go back home the same day. She's quite frightened of a blood clot or a burn when she hears these. She wants to know how often these complications occur. Rate of complications are about uh, 3 to 5 percent and uh, even if they do happen, there, there is uh, all anticoagulation and the effects of it are, is not very significant. She says that she's willing to proceed because she's still having these symptoms and been quite uncomfortable. So technically, how would you proceed with the endothermal ablation of the left greater saphenous vein? So I would have the patient in my office and uh, prep the whole leg right, right from the groin all the way down to the ankle and then access the great saphenous vein at above the knee, knee joint and then uh, I would inject uh, 
How do you want to access the vein? Under the ultrasound with a needle. Which needle do you want to use? I would start with a micropuncture needle and then uh, switch it over to uh, five French axis teeth. Okay. And then after you put in the five French, what do you want to do after that? I would uh, trace the great saphenous vein with my ultrasound uh, and all the way to the saphenofemoral junction and then inject some uh, tumescent fluid for the heat sink. For your ultrasound, which probe would you be using? I, I would be using the vascular probe, the flat uh, ultrasound probe. Okay, do you know there are a couple of different types of probes. Do you know which one you'd want to use? The five hertz frequency. When you're looking at her greater saphenous veins, saphenophalmal junction, it looks like it's about three centimeters from the skin. And in the thigh, it looks about the same. The 12 hertz frequency. Okay, so you use the 12 megahertz probe and um, it, you can't quite see down to three centimeters. It's hard to see the resolutions too deep. Then I would uh, de decrease, uh, I mean, use the probe with eight uh, megahertz frequency. Okay, so you're able to see pretty well now. You get your tumescent around the vein. What do you put in your tumescent? Normal saline. Okay, anything else? And uh, lidocaine for uh, local anesthesia, that one person uh, diluted. Anything else? Nothing else. Okay, that's fine. So you have your tumescent and you've injected around the vein. And what device do you want to use for closing the vein? I would... Uh, just use uh, compression, sir. This is a venous system and I've already ablated the vein, so this, I don't expect to have any significant bleeding from it. So I'll just compression for about five to uh, six minutes. What do you want to use for your endothermal ablation? I, I've only uh, used RFA here, sir. That I've not used or seen uh, the laser uh, ablation treatment. Okay, but you try to put your RFA into the five French sheath and it won't fit. It's too small. Upsize it to uh, six French sheath or seven French, whichever the, my uh, company is uh, recommending. Okay, how far from the saphenofemoral junction are you going to start? At least uh, three centimeters below the saphenofemoral junction. And how are you going to treat the vein? Are you going to just treat it every couple of centimeters? or? I, I would use the radio frequency for every centimeter uh, sequentially all the way up to my access point. Which radio frequency system are you using? I don't know the specific numbers of it. Okay, that's fine. So you go ahead and close the vein and after the procedure, any instructions for the patient? So I would uh, advise the patient uh, to be ambulating and uh, have the compression stockings uh, for three days and not to uh, take it off my ACE wrap. And then I would give her some uh, NSAIDs for uh, pain control. And and I also instruct the patient that if, the, if she develops significant swelling or pain or throbbing pain, then she should immediately uh, come back to the hospital or office to make sure that she does not develop any hydrogenic DVTs. She calls two days later saying that she is having some pain and swelling in the left calf. I would uh, get the patient back uh, to the office and do a repeat ultrasound uh, examination of uh, the venous system. They do a duplex. The vein is closed, and, but there is some clot extending into the saphenofemoral junction occupies probably around 20 to 30 percent of the common femoral vein. So this is a uh, heat induced uh, thrombosis secondary to my procedure. So I would, uh, if it is just 20 to 30 percent, uh, then I would treat the patient with anticoagulation. What type of anticoagulation do you want to put her on? I would uh, give the patient uh, the new one of the newer uh, oral 10A inhibit inhibitors like Eliquis or uh, Zeralto. Okay. And um, what uh, strength of Eliquis would you use? 10 milligrams for the first seven days. Uh, uh, switch to uh, five milligrams for the next three months. She's concerned about the bleeding complications. She reads the, the insert and she says, do I need to take it for three months? This being a second a DVT secondary to uh, hydrogenic uh, complication, I would suggest that you know, three months would be the best option. We can. I would always bring the patient back one month later to reassess if there's any progression of the clot. And if it's completely resolved, then I would uh, suggest that she can uh, to stop the anticoagulation earlier. Okay, so she comes back a month later and the thrombosis is completely gone, you go ahead and stop the eloquist, but she still has the varicose veins and they didn't get that much smaller. They're still painful. So uh, repeat, uh, I would do a repeat uh, uh, duplex study, making sure that the perforators are still comp competent. The perforators look competent. They are small, but she has isolated varicosities, which are quite large. They're four to seven millimeters. Uh, then I would uh, uh, suggest aphlebectomy to uh, remove the...
residual varicose vein. Okay, she wants to know are there any other alternatives? I can not think of any alternatives other than doing a staphylococcus. She's willing to proceed. She wants to know the risks and benefits. So the risks are uh, superficial skin infection and uh, that there could be some residual varicosities even after the procedure and the benefits are that I'd be able to take out most of the varicose veins and the incisions would be very small stab. She's willing to proceed. She wants to know how often these complications occur. Complication rates, uh, infection rates are less than 1% if done in a clean uh, environment. She's willing to proceed. How would you proceed with the procedure? So I would uh, bring the patient to the operating room depending upon where the varicose veins are at the posterior or medial or anterior aspect. I would have the patient either in supine or uh, prone position under light sedation and then I would uh, mark the uh, varicose veins preoperatively when the patient is standing uh, and then uh, prep the leg and then do a small stab uh, incisions wherever the most prominent part of the vein and then I would uh, take the veins out. What do you want to perform your incisions with? Uh, 11 blade uh, stab knife. And what do you want to evolve the tissue with? I would use a fine uh, dissecting uh, forceps and uh, mosquito forceps to Ovals the veins out. After you get all of the veins out, what dressing do you want to use? I uh, usually use uh, uh, benzoin and uh, steroid strips, and then I'd use uh, abdominal pads with curlix and a compression dressing. She wakes up from anesthesia and she wants to know how long to leave the dressing on. Uh, I usually leave the dressing on for 72 hours and uh, limb elevation for 72 hours, and then uh, take the ACE wrap out, and the patient can shower after that. Great. She comes back and she's very happy. Her pain, her swelling, her varicosities are much better and she's thankful. Great job. Thank you, sir. Okay, great. Um, I think we have one more case. We have a 33-year-old patient who comes in with painful swelling in the left leg for two days. How do you want to evaluate this patient with swelling and pain? I'll start uh, again with the history. Was there any uh, significant uh, trauma or change in the activity or anything that was different from her usual in the last day, couple of days ago? She had taken a long car ride down to Florida two days ago. Okay. And uh, is there any previous history of uh, significant swellings like this in the past? No. She never had this type of swelling. This is something new. All right. Does she have any family history of uh, D DVTs or tendency towards uh, hypercoagulability? She says yes. Her mother had a history of DVT when she was about 35 years old and her dad also had a history of clots but she's not sure of the details. Okay. Then I would go on to do a physical examination of the patient. She's in no apparent distress. She's alert and oriented. She has palpable pedal pulses. Abdomen is soft and non-tender. Her swelling extends up to the left mid-thigh. Okay. So at this point of time the history suggests that the patient this was a provoked uh, DVT that the patient had a very long uh, car drive but I would also have uh, at the back of my mind that there is a family history so I would want to rule out systemic uh, hypercoagulable causes for this DVT and then I would uh, send uh, the patient for a venous duplex examination of bilateral lower extremities and along with get a blood work done to make sure that the patient does not have any hypercoagulable disorders. Which test do you want to work her up with? So I would uh, want to look for uh, antithrombin uh, 3 deficiencies protein C and uh, protein S deficiency and uh, factor 5 laden uh, mutation. Anything else? And uh, lupus. Uh, lupus. SLE. Antiphospholipid syndrome. Okay, they're trying to find the test and they can't find it under lupus. Okay, they can't find a test for that specific title. But nonetheless, you send the rest of those tests and you send it for a venous duplex. The lab that you send it to says they have to send it out. So the test won't be back for a couple of days. The venous duplex that you do says is an acute DVT extending from the common femoral vein down to the tibials. Okay. Any other tests that you want to order besides the left lower extremity venous duplex? They only looked from the common femoral vein down. So I would uh, send the patient back to my tech and uh, look for uh, the opposite leg also and a CT venogram to look for any central uh, venous uh, thrombosis or uh, compressive symptoms. The right leg shows no DVT. The CT venogram shows an acutely thrombosed left iliac vein. Entire vein, external, common, or all thrombos. Okay, so at this point of time, uh, I would start the patient immediately on therapeutic anticoagulation, uh, considering the patient is symptomatic, and I would also have an, at the back of my mind, this is being the left uh, common iliac vein, that she could have a compressive uh, Maytherner syndrome kind of picture. She wants to know what can be done for this blood clot. All right, so I would uh, recommend uh, catheter brace uh, thrombolysis and thrombectomy for this patient. She wants to know why you want to do this procedure, what are the benefits of doing this? The most important uh, thing is uh, even though therapeutic anticoagulation would 
eventually dissolve the uh, thrombus but it will also have uh, the patient have between 20 to 25 percent chances of having a post thrombotic syndrome in her uh, lower extremity with uh, persistent swelling and uh, trophic changes and uh, catheterized thrombolysis and thrombectomy would hasten the process of clearing the blood clots and uh, re-establishing the venous re- uh, circulation she's a scientist she works at the nih and she wants to know what the data is supporting this this therapy that you're proposing uh, there's uh, data, good data showing that uh, there is a significant reduction in the post-thrombotic syndrome to about less than 10% with uh, the catheterized uh, thrombolysis, which was uh, seen in the C-TRAC trial. Okay. And what were the details of this trial? I don't know the exact numbers of the trial. Okay. She is asking for alternatives. Alternatives are uh, that the patient can be uh, non-operatively managed with uh, therapeutic anticoagulation, whether it is uh, with a heparin or low molecular weight heparin, which the patient can take at home by herself. Any other alternatives? I, I, don't, I can't think of any other alternatives. She states that she's concerned about how these clots would be dissolved. How do you go about that? So, I would uh, discuss with the patient that the catheter based thrombolysis can be different, done in a couple of different ways. One is uh, pharmacomechanical using uh, a TPA infusion catheter or an angiojet, which is a suction aspiration device, or a purely mechanical thrombectomy uh, like Inari device where we can do a mechanical thrombectomy. She's interested in what the thrombolysis entails. So I would uh, explain to the patient that uh, the, we, I'm going to keep have the patient in prone position, access the popliteal vein uh, with a uh, micro access needle under ultrasound and then shoot a venogram determine the extent of uh, the thrombosis which is now I know that uh, preoperatively extends all the way up to the common iliac vein then I would insert a TPA infusion catheter and then marinate it, uh, the clot with uh, TPA overnight for about 12 hours and then bring the patient back for a second stage a venogram and a thrombectomy She's concerned about bleeding with TPA So the data suggests that chances of bleeding in a health, healthy patient is uh, very minimal less than about five uh, percent, and the risk benefit ratio there is more benefits than risk with uh, the TPA. So, would you use any other techniques besides TPA thrombolysis? The other option is to use an angiojet, uh, which is a suction aspiration thrombolysis, where we don't have to use the TPA. So, which one would you use in this patient? If the, in this patient, if the patient is uh, concerned about the bleeding uh, complications, then I would do, use an angiojet, and at the same time, I will also use uh, I was intravenous ultrasound study to make sure that she doesn't have a maternal compression. When you pass the wire up from the popliteal vein, the clot in the popliteal and the femoral vein feel quite soft and mushy. But when you try to get through the common iliac vein, it feels somewhat more firm. It's not the same. You do your suction thumbectomy using your angiojet. Which catheter would you use with your angiojet? Eight French uh, catheter. Catheter? Do you know the name? I, I don't know the exact name. Okay, the nurse gives you the eight French Zolante catheter and you go ahead and take out the clots. There's still clots left in the common iliac vein. They feel somewhat firm and there's still clots left in the common iliac vein, although the rest of the vein, the femoral popliteal segment, looks good. Right. So at this point, uh, planned before, I would use the intravenous ultrasound to access the vein and see what's happening, whether the wall is thickened, whether it's collapsed, or it could be secondary to a chronic uh, DVT, which the patient did not have any symptoms in the past. It looks like there's a chronic component in the left common iliac vein. There's some filling defects in the area that you notice on the ivus. So the thing is, am I able to get my wire across that uh, compression or stenosis? Yes. Okay. And at this point, then I would send a balloon up uh, my wire, open up the uh, common iliac vein with a balloon plasty, and then I would uh, stent it. You stent it and some of the clot extrudes into the stent. I would uh, keep the patient on uh, therapeutic anticoagulation postoperatively. It looks like it's a 90% lesion still, despite the stent and the balloon angioplasty and the left common iliac vein, because now the clot is within the stent. It's basically Swiss cheesed into the interstices of your stent. Then uh, once I've stented it, then at this point, if I still have my angiojet, I would send my angiojet up the vein and see if I can suction out the clot. You do a venogram after that, and now the whole thing has closed and the dye isn't moving any place. At this point, I, I would uh, abort the procedure because I, don't, I can't think of any other options to proceed. Did you want to give heparin at the beginning of the procedure? Yes. Sir, I, I would definitely get the... So if you give the heparin, do you routinely get 
an activated clotting time or assessment to see how the anticoagulation is? Then the patient might have uh, anti-thrombin deficiency. Then uh, I would give the patient FFPs to... So your anesthesiologist gets the ACT and the ACT is normal. It's still 130, same as the baseline. How much FFP do you want to give her? I would give her uh, two units of FFPs. The ACT starts to increase. You do a balloon angioplasty and stent and suction and the stents look clear. Okay, so at this point... What do you want to do after the procedure? I would uh, continue the patient on uh, therapeutic anticoagulation with heparin and also give the patient FFPs to replenish her antithrombin levels. So you get a PTT in the recovery room and it's normal while you have the heparin running or an, or a factor 10A level and it's normal. I will use uh, the different anticoagulation uh, such as uh, biluridin. Which other alternatives do you have for a patient who might be hypercoagulable? Uh, Coumadin is uh, as an oral anticoagulant, direct NA inhibitors. Any other options that would make her anticoagulated in the recovery room? Right now, I, I can't think anything of my head. Okay. So if you put her on Coumadin, are there any complications to starting her on Coumadin right away? Yes. Uh, there's always a risk of uh, kin necrosis, secondary to uh, uh, the microvascular uh, thrombosis when we start the Coumadin. Okay. And why does that occur? Because uh, the Coumadin, uh, the anti-vitamin K uh, effects also decreases uh, protein C and protein S along with the 2, 7, 9, and 10. So that increases the chances of having microthrombi. Is that a problem with a patient who's hypercoagulable who might have a protein C or protein S deficiency? Yes, could be a problem uh, that the patient can develop uh, skin necrosis. If you have skin necrosis, how would you treat that? If the patient was started on the medical service for DVT and there was a, a rash in the buttocks or the breasts or fatty areas and you were concerned about Coumadin skin necrosis, Process, how would you treat that? Angiomax or uh, some other kind of IV anticoagulation or fondoparanox switcher to some other different kind of anticoagulant, IV anticoagulant. Those are reasonable. Those are reasonable options also. So the patient is doing much better. She's anticoagulated now and she's going home. When do you want to see her again? I would uh, bring the patient back uh, to my office in two weeks' time. Her antithrombin 3 level comes back that she is deficient in the antigen and the activity. So at this point of time, I would uh, get a hematology consult for this patient to see uh, further recommendation regarding supplementation or how to proceed with this uh, antithrombin deficiency. Your hematologist is out of town. He broke his leg, so he's not able to see the patient. So the patient wants you to give her a suggestion until the hematologist is in town. I, I would uh, continue the patient on uh, the fact direct factor 10A inhibitors such as Eliquis or uh, Zeralto and wait for uh, the hematologist. How long do you want to keep her on anticoagulation with the Eliquis? For six months. Okay. So we should probably review some of these. Uh, yeah, let's, so let's go. Uh, that was very good, both of you guys. A nice little review. Yeah, Vijay, you did a pretty good job. So Dr. Hingarani, you want to go over the first case and then we can talk about some of the mistakes and some of the positive things that he did? Sure. So you did a really great job on the history and physical. That's one of the most common mistakes that I find for some trainees where they don't get the history and physical. And you got the family history and you got the prior history of DVT, which is a very common area that people gloss over. So congratulations. Thank you, sir. Your physical exam, you paid attention to it and you picked up on small details that would alter your history, your diagnosis and treatment. So congratulations on that. That's really a very common error. I would suggest doing some hands-on duplex exams and also the radiofrequency ablations. These are very common procedures in vascular surgery. I would know the technical details of the radiofrequency ablations or the laser. You actually did fairly well. You know some some of the textbook descriptions of these procedures, you knew that the patient had an E-hit and your treatment is some, there is some controversy about treatment about E-hit level two, but nonetheless, despite the controversy and the clinical significant E-hit two, you treated the patient and the patient did well. Uh, Dr. Hingarani, how would you treat E-hit? Typically here, we treat it with about two weeks of anticoagulation. He said, Vijay said three months. I think that's a little bit long. What are your records? So the American Venus Forum is actually looking at that specific issue with the EHIT guidelines. They're in for the Journal of Vascular Surgery under review now. So I'm actually not able to say anything until that publication comes out. But there is literature looking at treatment options for EHIT 1 and 2. And three months is probably not needed for an EHIT 2. So I think most people would probably 
at least anticoagulate them until the clot retracts back to the saphenothymal junction. So I, I think two weeks is actually reasonable, quite frankly. I think a lot of people find that the clots are gone within a very limited time period, especially for EHIT2. Exactly. And there are people who don't even treat EHIT2, quite frankly, because they resolve so quickly, they have very few long-term impacts. Yeah, sometimes you see that moving thrombus a little bit, and it's, it's a, it can be a little scary. So I typically treat it. Uh, I think it's just safe for a good two weeks of treatment. And, um, you know, on occasion where I've had this uh, problem, it seems to resolve. So, but yeah, I, I agree at three months, maybe a little bit long. The other thing I think uh, VJ forgot to talk about when, when you asked him about varicose veins, the trainees have to remember it's compression first. And I think that's why you didn't let him get away with performing any kind of uh, additional procedures or get a, additional uh, examinations because I think he, he failed to mention compression. Is, is that right? Is that where you were getting out with the insurance companies denying what he was asking? Absolutely. All of the worldwide guidelines call for compression as first-line therapy. That's standard. It should be enforced. And if you're not going to prescribe it, others will encourage you or deny your care until you do so. Right. Some, sometimes the insurance companies ask for a compliance or uh, at least recommendation for approximately six months of compression therapy before you can move on to any kind of treatment of varicose veins. Uh, in this case, uh, these veins were symptomatic, and I think he, he did the right thing. He said radiofrequency ablation, but I'm going to call him out on it here. He said that's what we use here. The reality is we actually don't use that here. We <laughs> here we use um, laser, but this is often the problem with, I think, um, all the fellows or trainees that are finishing is that they don't do the venous procedures in the office until about a month or two before they graduate, and then they come in and they said, hey, I need to do all the Venus procedures that are possible in the office and teach me right now. So I think that's where <laughs> VJ will probably be headed in the next month or so. But like Dr. Hingarani said, you, you do have to know these procedures. You do have to know what types of probes you're going to use. The hertz of the probes, typically about an 8 hertz, uh, megahertz probe is what we use. Remember, the higher the frequency. Uh, that's used for very, very superficial vessels such as radial artery and things like that. Am I right, Dr. Ingerani? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the basic because ultrasound is something you need to know. You're going to be taking the RPI exam. You're going to need to have the basics under your belt. This is our bread and butter for diagnosis and treatment. You need to know the basics of ultrasound and for venous disease. Exactly. And that's always going to be tested on the oral boards, that's for sure. Another question is you told him, I think this patient on that first scenario had deep venous reflux. How did you want him to manage it? I think he was asking. He wanted to go in with an ultrasound, intravascular ultrasound, and evaluate the iliac veins. Where were you taking him up that way when you have a patient has varicose veins and also deep system reflux? There's no real good literature about how iliac vein stenting affects the deep system or the superficial system. However, there are some ongoing trials looking at that specific issue. And VJ also hit on an important issue about which one do you do first? Do you do the ablations first or do you do look at the iliac veins? And there's some literature that goes back and forth on that also. So VJ, some of the questions you had, we don't have good answers for, but I do think that it is worth knowing the literature, knowing the effects, the risk benefits alternatives of these procedures. And you knew those. Thank you, sir. Anything else, Dr. Hingarani, on that first scenario? And then we can talk about the second if there was nothing else. I think you did a good job overall, but I do think there's some areas that were identified that you need to work on for basic venous pathophysiology physio in terms of treatment. Yeah, I think we'll get him in the office and have him uh, on my vein day. Yeah, I think you need to start following us around. Let's uh, let's talk about that second scenario, that patient with the, with the DVT, the iliofemoral DVT you gave him. One thing I, d I wrote down when he was talking about the trials that you asked him what type, well, how to manage that problem, right? So uh, I think he jumped a little bit, jumped the gun, and uh, he wanted to go ahead and start to uh, lice this patient, what have you. I think that's literature is still out there as well, is what, what to do with these patients, patients with uh, iliofemoral DVTs out there. I don't think there's any clear cut evidence of how to treat those. You can still treat those with medical management unless the patient has significant symptoms. Absolutely. But it's important to know what little literature we have that's randomized controlled trials. And the reason why a tract is so important is that we have very little RCTs. Know the RCTs well because they're fair game on your riddance and your oral exams. Now, Dr. Singh has pointed out a point, important weaknesses of this trial also, that it wasn't so clear cut in terms of its effects on iliofemoral DVT in terms of long-term post-lobitic symptoms, although at least up to two years. We don't we don't have the five-year data. Yeah, exactly. The, I think a lot of people thought the that this trial, we're talking about the ATTRACT trial. Now, BJ said C-TRACT. C-TRACT is a different 
trial. That's a trial that's still ongoing. That's looking at chronic DVTs. But the ATTRACT trial is what Dr. Hingarani was, what he's talking about. And that's that trial where we just, I think you, you mentioned that there's good literature that you can lice these patients. They'll have good results in terms of post phobic syndrome. That's actually not true. The ATTRACT trial did not show that. It, it only showed that there was moderate improvement with these patients compared to patients that receive uh, anticoagulation alone. So I, I agree, there's, there's just not enough literature out there. Uh, when, the, when the leg is so swollen and the, and the patient is young and the patient is very symptomatic, we're a little bit more aggressive than we used to be. But again, I don't think we have great literature. Out. But nonetheless, you said this patient has an aleofemoral DVT. She's 33 years old. And you said this patient might benefit. You knew the risk benefits alternatives. You knew the technique. And that's important. The hypercoagulable states, there's a chance that they may ask that on the orals or the written exams. There's a good chance. If you got into that stage, you're doing pretty well. But do know some of the other agents besides Coumadin, um, besides IV heparin. You mentioned some of the other agents Angiomax. But don't forget, basic agatroban is fairly uh, readily accessible um, and fairly easy to control. Coumadin is important also, but know some of the problems with Coumadin and know some of the problems that are with the DOAX. Yes, exactly. That's definitely up for grabs. If, But like you said, that's deep into the conversation. So if they're asking you those details, that means you've uh, you've hit everything else right. And now they're, just, now they're really testing you on, on some high level stuff. Yeah, I think Vijay did, uh, he did a pretty good job on that as well. Let me try to think. I think that was all. I, I wrote down some of the, the issues uh, that you guys were talking about that we had issues with uh, and some of the important things. I think we highlighted everything. I think uh, that was a pretty good scenario and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, VJ. This was a lot of fun and good luck on your exams. I'm sure you're going to do fine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You have a good day. Be well. Take care. All right. That's all. And I'll thank you so much. Hope to see you soon. Looking forward to it. That was an amazing session. Actually filled up a lot of my knowledge gaps when it comes to venous physiology and treatment of venous disease. Dr. Singh, I did have a few questions, especially some technical details about radiofrequency ablation and laser, since, you know, we don't really get to do as many of these cases. And I think all of the residents and fellows would benefit on information about these two procedures. Oh, okay. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Hingarani made a very good point. I think it's always a good idea to come down to the vascular lab, do the ultrasounds yourself. Here at our fellowship, we do the first two weeks of the fellowship is really being down at the vascular lab, following the vascular technicians around and scanning the DVTs, arterial duplex, really get to know the ultrasound machine. Fortunately, the fellows, I don't think they always comply. And as soon as they see a nice case, they run out of the vascular lab and go do that instead. But, I, you know, it, this highlights how important that is. You do have to know the probes and what have you. The second part is the fellows really should be going to the office and do venous procedures. It's very important when you get out in practice. Uh, you'll be amazed at how many of these procedures you're going to have to do because that's that's part of your practice. So it's a very good idea to, to start. Okay, so let's talk about talk about the procedure. So, you know, as we discussed, when patients come in with varicose veins, first and foremost, always compression. So you need to do six months of compression therapy, see if that helps. If that doesn't help and the patient is symptomatic, only then and only then can you go ahead and treat these patients. When you treat them, you want to check for saphenous vein and you want to check the patient with a, in a standing position, check the saphenous vein. You compress the, the, the calf, put an ultrasound probe on the saphenous vein. And you, when you compress the, the calf, you're going to see the blood going upwards. When that blood starts coming back down, that's con called reflux. And if that reflux is greater than 500 milliseconds, that's considered an incompetent saphenous vein. Uh, typically, we wait even more than that. Uh, so 500 milliseconds is really not that much, but that's considered reflux. So if there is reflux, then the options are two to treat them. One is an open surgery. And uh, that's at what BJ initially said, uh, open meaning ligation of the saphenous, saphenofemoral junction and stripping of the vein. But that's kind of a pretty morbid operation uh, and it's pretty painful. So we often offer these patients a radio frequency ablation or laser uh, treatment of the saphenous vein. Uh, when you compare the outcomes between the two, they're very similar, open versus endovenous uh, surgery. Uh, now, of course, when you do endovenous surgery, there is a small risk that these veins can open back up and the patient may need the procedure again, or the second time you may need to just ligate the vein. Uh, but when you're doing the procedure, it's typically done in the office. We access at the knee or just a little bit above the knee. We don't access at the, at the ankle. 
why is that weak? because uh, first thing is the amount of soft tissue coverage very less in the leg so the patient will have more skin issues there could be uh, ulcerations and uh, heat sink effects are less and those veins could uh, if there is there's any residual veins we can always do a small stab trepectomy and uh, remove them instead of uh, doing a radio frequency ablation yeah well the the biggest reason we don't do it is there's high risk of nerve injury nerves that run right along the saphenous vein you're going to wind up burning that uh, those nerves and then cause a lot of pain with these patients so that's why we go above the knee so when we place the, our probe you can use either a a radio frequency probe or a laser probe. You take that probe, you bring it up to the, the saphenous femoral junction, and then you pull it back up usually about two centimeters from the inferior epigastric vein. That, that's what uh, that's the answer that he was looking for. You also infuse tumescent, tumescent, which consists of usually saline and saline, a little bit of bicarb, and also uh, lidocaine. You infuse that on top of the vein uh, this way. Number one, it, it prevents uh, some of that pain and it also pushes the skin away from, from all that tissue. And this way, you don't get a burn of the skin. Uh, so what you basically do is you turn on the machine, you start pulling it, pulling it back and you heat the entire vein. Once that vein is heated, it basically thrombosis. The only risk of that is what we said, e-hit, meaning um, endothermal induced thrombosis of the vein. Basically what that means is the clot winds up encroaching into the femoral vein, which can obviously is dangerous because now you've got a common, fem common femoral DVT. Now there's four types of four types of e-hits that are out there. Uh, you guys really should know which one is which. Type four being the worst, that means it's a complete DVT and a complete occlusion of the common femoral vein. Type three is a partial occlusion of the femoral vein and what have you. Just take a look and know what those uh, which of those are. And treatment for these is usually not like a regular DVT. This is something that you've quickly in induced. You tre treat these patients with anticoagulation, a short-term anticoagulation, have them come back in two to three weeks or so, check it again, and usually that part is, has resolved. PJ, what was your experience undergoing this Mark Oro? Uh, it, it was a really uh, uh, eye-opening experience of uh, where my deficiencies in my knowledge are and uh, where I have to you know, fill up my knowledge gap and also made me realize that I need to go back and do my office procedures and learn much more in detail because in real life I would have to do this on my own and I have very little knowledge of the office based venous ablative procedures. Yeah, I'm going to call on you again for another mock oral pretty soon. Yeah, sure, man. Yeah, I think that's a, it's very good practice and it's nice that you know, the fellows are willing to do it. It's always nerve wracking, but it's a very good preparation for the real thing. So I think for VJs. I assume all you guys would agree with me when I say that was one fantastic mock oral board review on venous pathology. Thank you guys very much for listening. We have gotten tremendous support for these series and we would like to keep them coming. Do subscribe to our channel and share the channel with your friends and colleagues so you can support us. Until next time, thank you and have a good day.